This talk uh, is actually the same talk I gave at uh, ChefConf a month ago, and I actually created it at, for Go to Aarhus last year because Jean Kim was going to give this talk, and he created the title and the abstract. And then about a month before I was going to give the talk, he, uh, he didn't have time to work on it anymore, so he made me write it and give it. So this is actually Jean's talk, but one that I designed and I'm going to give you. And it's really about going back to the roots of Lean, which is the Toyota production system, and looking at how that can inform the adoption of DevOps, because really DevOps goes back to this whole kind of lean, lean thinking. And so we start with a bit of history and then go into how you can actually apply this in real life. And the focus, as you might expect, is on culture and practices, not on the things that people actually tend to focus on, which is tools and uh, kind of tactical stuff, because that's the wrong thing to focus on. Um, and this is the right stuff to focus on. Um, so the Toyota production system comes originally from the production line uh, of building cars. And this is a picture of a Toyota factory in the UK. Uh, and here you go, here's the cars rolling down uh, the production line. And the Toyota production system talks about how we can make this process more efficient, more responsive to user needs, and we get things like um, you know, pool-based systems, managing work in process, Kanban, all these concepts that are applied to software development originally come from the production line. However, there's a problem with this. I mean, this is actually manufacturing real things in real life. In the context of building software-based products and services, where's the production line? Right? We have a metaphor that we can somehow apply this thing and the principles that govern how to make this efficient to this completely different thing. Uh, and actually, it's important to bear in mind that this is a metaphor. There is no actual production line here. There are no cars going through this office unless something very bad is happening normally. That's a sign that there's something wrong with your development process if people are dr literally driving cars through it. Um, so how do you actually apply those principles and that kind of philosophy to this completely different thing. Um, and people have tried to unpack that in a bunch of different ways. So uh, there's a great book by Charles Betts called Architecture and Patterns for IT, where he says, well, you know, actually, the way people often think about it is the factory, building the factory and designing the factory and the production lines is like our product portfolio lifecycle. And then what, what the cars are, if you like, are the individual manufactured products that come out of our service portfolio. And that's one way of kind of taking that building cars metaphor and applying it to IT. Another way to think about it is that actually the factory is the life cycle of one individual service that gradually evolves over time. And then the individual transactions, when I you know, buy something or request a service, those are the, like the cars coming off the production line. The individual service request is like the, the, the asking for a car to be built and that coming off the production line. Um, and, and so you can certainly think about it in these ways. And there's fruitful things you can get out of uh, these metaphors for you know, the product portfolio or the IT service portfolio. Uh, and there's a great book uh, by a guy called Don Reinertsen called The Principles of Product Development Flow, which you know, takes this metaphor of uh, you know, lean as product development uh, and derives a great amount of very, very interesting stuff from that. This is a really great book for people who are geeks about uh, process and product development and managing product development. Um, uh, and it draws on a lot of lean ideas. Although, as Don points out, when he was writing about this stuff uh, 20 years ago, no one had really, th the, the term lean had not even been invented at that point. So he, he kind of predates that. One application of that metaphor that we see a lot in software development in particular is the idea of the Kanban board or the storyboard. And here, these individual things, which are pieces of work, like stories or bug fixes or whatever, those are like the cars moving along the production line. And uh, what we do is we think about how to improve the efficiency of the delivery process by you know, creating a pool system here, by looking at how long it takes individual stories to move across the board. Um, but it's not a perfect metaphor. A lot of the stuff that goes into the Toyota production system about improving efficiency is based on knowing what people are doing and seeing what they're doing and actually looking and seeing what they're doing and seeing how you know, people actually 
looking at how they could improve their own process. There's this concept of going to Gemba in Lean, which is actually visiting the factory floor and timing people doing things and talking together about how that process could be improved. It's very difficult to do that in this environment. You can't just you know, talk about, well, we're going to time how long it takes to build a test for this story and go and sit by the QAs and be like, you know, stop the stopwatch. How long is it going to take you to build the acceptance test? Like, no one does that because that would be a bit creepy and uh, people wouldn't like it. And uh, the variability is really high and uh, it's very different for every person. So even the concept of standardization in this context is, is really, really hard. And a lot of the ideas that go into the title production system don't obviously apply when we think of you know, the concept of cars moving along the production line being like stories on a story wall. So it's important to bear in mind we've got a lot from this idea of Kanban as managing stories uh, or managing tasks bugs, whatever, but it is just a metaphor. And it's by no means a perfect metaphor. So what other metaphors could there be for the production line in software development? Well, in 2006, me and Dan North, uh, who is presenting today, I think just presented the session before me, and uh, Chris Reed, who's also here today, we wrote a paper. Hi, Chris. Here's Chris. So Chris and me and Dan wrote this paper in 2006 uh, for the Agile conference in, uh, where was it, do you remember? Minneapolis, I think. Uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And uh, Dan decided he was going to call this the deployment production line, basically because of this metaphor. And it only occurred to me much later that actually that's, that allows you to apply a lot of lean principles to what we're thinking of. But the key concept in this was that actually what, what we're looking at is the basic unit of work being a change in version control. And a change in version control creates a build, and the build progresses through the deployment line to production. And when it hits production, it delivers value to people. Um, and, and, and so that's a very different metaphor from all the other ones. The idea of a build is very concrete. Um, and it turns out you can get lots of interesting stuff out of this metaphor of production line as process for deploying changes and the individual unit of change being version control change leading to a build. So what work can we get out of that? In order to understand what this gives us that's different from the other metaphors, we have to go back to the roots of Toyota. So who knows what Toyota was building before they were building cars? Textile stuff. Textile stuff. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So Toyota wasn't originally called Toyota. The family who created Toyota is actually called the Toyota family. And their breakthrough product was the Toyota Automatic Loom Type G. Uh, and this is a picture of it. So this, I think, was in the 20s. Um, I can't exactly remember, but around the, so, you know, nearly a century ago now. Um, and the key breakthrough in this particular product was that it could detect when there was a problem. So if it ran out of threads or if the loom kind of got caught up or something like that. If there was any problem in the process of producing the fabric, the loom would automatically stop and notify the operator that it had a problem. And this created a huge improvement in productivity. First of all, it became impossible to produce defective products because the moment anything happened which would result in a defective product, the machine would stop. Secondly, up to the point at which this machine was created, any time there was a problem, um, the, the, the operator would have to be watching the loom, sitting at the loom watching it to, to manually validate that what was being produced was actually good and, and, and notice immediately that there was a problem and stop it there and then. So you had to have a person for every loom manually inspecting the output, uh, running tests, if you like, manually to make sure that the product was actually good. And when you have a system that detects problems itself and stops itself, you only need one person per room of looms. You can have one person whose job it is to monitor all the looms because they don't have to do anything. They just have to wait for the loom to detect a problem and then they intervene themselves. Now, this is a game changer in terms of productivity for manufacturing textiles. But it turns out that this idea is central not only to Toyota manufacturing of cars, but also to software development. 
And it's so important that, of course, there's a Japanese term for it. Uh, and any time there's kind of an important lean concept, you have to know the Japanese term. That's very important. Mm -hmm. But I think that the history of this term is kind of interesting. Uh, if you go and read Toichi, sorry, um, Ono's book on, uh, Taichi Ono's book on uh, workplace management, he kind of talks about the history of this term that they came up with. So this is the Japanese word for um, automation. It's actually Chinese characters. And then this is the Chinese character for a person. And so what they did is they said, well, we've got automation. Automation is you know, the automatic loom, but we need people in order to be able to intervene when something goes wrong. And if we take those two concepts and put them together, we come up with this term. And what, what's happened kind of in, in, in the language is that this character turns into a radical, which is added here, uh, which is how this word is different from this word. We've got this kind of extra radical here representing the addition of people to the process. And that gives us auto automation, which is sometimes translated as automation with a human element. And the idea is that we leverage machines and people for their things that they're particularly good at. Machines are good for performing repetitive tasks. Humans are good for solving problems. And the way we produce a high quality product is that we use the machines to do the boring automated work repeatedly, and we use the humans to solve the problems, and we create systems in which those two elements can do what they're best at. And by combining them, that's how we build quality in to whatever it is we're producing. And so this is central to the Toyota production system, this concept of Jidoka. Um, and in particular, the idea of the automatic loom detecting problems and notifying users lives on uh, in the concept of the, the andon cords and the display board that tells you when something's wrong. So who's heard of the andon cords? Uh, so in a Toyota factory, there's a cord that you can pull which lets people know that you've got a problem. So basically, if you're on the production line and these marks on the ground basically are the time in seconds that it's taking for this car to move past this person's workspace. And if this person hasn't completed the task they're supposed to complete by the time it gets to here, then what they'll do is they'll pull the andon cord. And that will summon a manager to come and help them. And if they can't get the problem fixed together, um, then they can pull the andon cord again and it will actually stop the production line. Now, these two concepts are really revolutionary. About 20 years ago, GM created a joint venture with Toyota. And it was the first time Toyota had been in a joint venture with another company. And they created a plant called Numi in Fremont in California. And the Numi plant um, was, had just been shut down by GM because it had the worst workforce. Uh, the union admitted that it was the work, worst workforce and it had the worst management and it produced the worst quality products. And so they shut down the plant and they said, well, we'll use this for our first joint venture. And then Toyota did something kind of radical. They actually rehired all those people and sent them to Japan to train them to create the Numi plant, which is a joint venture. So they said, we're going to hire all these people who are the worst workforce in GM in the USA, and we're going to use these people as the basis for our new factory. Kind of a nuts thing to do. I mean, this workforce was known for doing things like they were so pissed off with their jobs, they would do things like putting empty Coke bottles inside the doors so that the doors would rattle when you shut them and open them. <laughs> like, that's how miserable and discontented they were with their jobs. So they went to Japan and got the kind of the Toyota training and they came back and within I think a few months of starting up the Numi plant, the Numi plant was the most productive workforce in all of the USA in GM's portfolio and they also produced products in terms of cars which were as high quality as the cars that were produced in the Toyota plant in Japan. And there were several things which I think, so if you, there's a podcast on this, um, a This American Life podcast on the Numi plant, which I highly recommend everyone listens to. I mean, This American Life is great anyway, but the Numi podcast is really, really brilliant. And two of the things that the people, they interviewed the people who actually were working in the GM plant and went and got the training. Two things that were different. Firstly, you know, the idea that if something goes wrong, you can pull a cord and a manager will come and that manager will then help you that was kind of a revolutionary concept, rather than the manager coming and shouting at you and then trying to fire you, that the manager would actually help you. Wow. Uh, and then the other revolutionary concept is the idea that a worker has the power to stop the line. So in GM factories traditionally, what would happen is 
no one, the line would never be stopped, right? What would happen is the cars would come off the production line, many of them would have defects, they'd put them into a lot and fix them later. And there was a huge lot full of cars piling up that had defects of various kinds. And then with a Toyota production system, anytime you find a defect, if you can't fix it in time, you pull the cord, the production line stops. So that was a revolutionary concept. So one thing pe people don't get is how often the Andon cord is pulled. So how many times do you think the Andon cord gets pulled in a Toyota factory? Any guesses? Once a month, higher. 100 times a day. 100 times a day, a day. higher. 1,000 times a day, higher. So it's actually about 3,000 times a day that the Andon core gets pulled. So the production line doesn't stop every time the Andon core gets pulled, but the, the, that Andon core gets pulled 3,000 times a day on average. It's a lot more often than people think. And that demonstrates the level of collaboration within the organization between the people doing the work and the management. It's a very collaborative uh, environment. So this idea of actually stopping the line, of uh, having a system to detect quality problems the moment they occur rather than waiting them for them to get out to users, has an analog in software development, and the analog is continuous integration. So who in the audience is practicing continuous integration on their team? Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. This is your exercise for this session. Keep your hands up. All right, so put your hands down unless all the engineers on your team are checking into trunk about once a day or more often than that. So if that's not true, if developers are checking into feature branches, that don't get then merged into trunk once a day, or if they're check not checking in that often, put your hands down. Otherwise, you can keep them up. OK, so we've lost about 2 thirds of the people. Um, so if every check-in doesn't result in build and unit tests being run, put your hands down. Otherwise, keep them up. OK, so we lost a couple. And then when the build breaks, if it then doesn't get fixed within about 10 minutes, put your hands down. If the build is often broken for more than 10 minutes, put your hands down, otherwise keep them up. OK, so there's about 10 people in the room who are actually doing continuous integration. So a round of applause for you guys. That's awesome. <laughs> continuous integration is really hard. It's not running Jenkins against your feature branches and then ignoring the build when it goes red. It's the practice of making sure your software is always working, and the moment you find the problem, you fix it straight away. If the bill goes red and everyone ignores it, it's like you know the, the loom detects the problem and stops, and the operator goes, ah, fuck it, <laughs> let's spew out a load more textile that's got breakages in it, you know, or like letting the car go on down the production line, and we'll put it in a lot, and then we'll fix it later. You know, that's what you're saying basically, is that you know, well, never mind, there's a problem, but. Whatever, I'm going to carry on writing code because that's what I like doing. So the practice of continuous integration is best described, in my opinion, in a paper by James Shaw, which talks about continuous integration on a dollar a day. Uh, and this is the process. I'm writing some code. Uh, I finish what I'm doing. I run the build and test locally to make sure they work and they pass. Yay. So at that point, I'm going to merge from trunk to make sure that my work harmonizes and merges correctly with the work that other people are doing on my team. So I'm going to pull from trunk into my local working copy and then merge and run the build and test again to make sure that that works. That's how doing this twice is how we distinguish my bug from a bug caused by the merge. At that point, I want to push into trunk on version control because I want to share my work with other people. Version control is primarily a sharing mechanism. It's a communication tool. Before I do that, I'm going to walk over to this old workstation in the, in, in the corner of the room, and I'm going to uh, see if the rubber chicken's there. If it's not there, it means someone else is checking in. I have to wait for the rubber chicken. When it becomes available, I take the rubber chicken, walk back to my computer. I check in, push into trunk, and then walk back to the old workstation. And then I check out from trunk, run the build and test on the other machine to prove that the thing actually works on a machine that's not my machine. So not just my machine, yay. If that's true, and it works, I put the rubber chicken down, ring the bell, ding, hooray, I'm done. Not done done, but done in the sense of works on a machine that's not just mine. If it doesn't work, I don't get to ring the bell, build's red, I've got two options. Option one, try and fix the problem. I've got a couple of minutes to try and find the file that I forgot to check in or whatever. What's my option two? Roll back, absolutely correct. The most selfish thing you can do as a developer is to leave broken code on a broken build on trunk. Because that means everyone else is working off something that's not known to be good. So yeah, if you find a problem, 
and you can't fix it straight away, pull your change out of version control. That's very, very important and an underused uh, practice. So yeah, in order to be able to do this, we need to make sure everyone's <laughs> checking into trunk at least once a day uh, and that we actually pay attention when that thing goes red. So the problem is the rubber chicken does not scale. So what does scale? Uh, well, once again, despite giving this talk last night, I've forgotten to add the right slide into my slide deck, uh, which is a clear failure of Judoka there. Um, so let's see if I can get it here. This should be quicker than last night because I actually know where it is now. Yeah, so here, this, is what, this is what they do at Google, and I find these stats pretty staggering. So 10,000 developers in more than 40 offices, more than 2,000 projects under development. Pretty much everything except Chrome and Android is checked into one enormous Perforce repository. And everything is built off Trunk. And all the developers check into Trunk. They get about 20 plus code changes into trunk per minute, that peaks at 60. About 50% of code change every month. Everything is developed and released from trunk, all builds go from source. And they run about over 100 million test cases per day. Here's another slide I stole uh, from Google. Um, they have about 200,000 test suites in their code base. They run 10 million test suites per day, more than 60 million individual test cases per day and growing, more than 4,000 CI builds a day. So this is the equivalent of the loom that detects the problems straight away after you check them in. This is what Google does that's the equivalent of the thing that was invented by Sakichi Toyoda in the 1920s for building textiles, but in 2014 for building software at scale. Same thing at work, basically. And it relies on having extremely good test automation that's very comprehensive and we can run it very, very quickly and get feedback straight away. And crucially, once we get that feedback, we actually do something about it and fix the problem rather than just letting the build stay red. Uh, and one of the things that is a practice at Google is that if something goes into trunk and it's broken, anybody else can revert that change. So if you break someone downstream of you, that person can revert your change and that's okay. So that concept of collective code ownership, that everyone owns the code and that anyone can revert someone else's bad change from trunk, that's just part of the culture and that's very, very important. However, just having those basic tests uh, that's part of your CI process is not enough. And the kind of the Google scale stuff foreshadows that. So just having a basic CI build, you want that build to run in a few minutes because you want to get the feedback fast. But that feedback is not going to be comprehensive, which is why you need a bunch of other tests, acceptance tests, and then further things like user acceptance testing, performance testing. I mean, this is a very simple diagram, but your process will be more complex than that. There's a number of different validations you have to add before you can get stuff to production. And so the question is, how do we build this? Where do we start? How do we evolve it? And in order to answer those questions, I'm going to give you a case study from a company that did this at scale. And that company is uh, Hewlett Packard. And the team that did it is the team that built the firmware for Hewlett Packard's laser jets. So the HP laser jet firmware team is about 400 people. 400 people distributed across three continents. There's a team in Porto Alegre in Brazil, there's a team in Boise, Idaho, and there's another team, I think, in either Delhi or Bangalore in India. Um, and so, sorry, Delhi or Bangalore in India. And so, 400 people distributed across three time zones, and they had a problem. Their problem was that they were going too slowly. They were not able to keep up with even the new versions of the, f of the hardware that were coming out, let alone building new features for new products. They were on the, the software was on the critical path. And this is a common reason that we see people adopting continuous delivery is when software is on the critical path. That's when people start saying, we need to get better at doing this. And so the first thing they did, well, actually, it's not the first thing they did. Before they actually tried to engineer their way out of the problem. They tried hiring people, firing people, outsourcing people, all the usual things that big companies do. Uh, and when none of that worked, then the marketing and product people came to the engineers and say, please help us fix this problem using engineering, which is how you know things are really bad <laughs> when people are asking the engineers for help. Uh, and so the first thing they looked at is what are they actually spending their time doing? And so they found that out. 
uh, basically using a pretty lightweight informal system of just asking people what they were spending their time doing. And this is what they found. So to understand why this is true, you have to understand that every time a new line of devices came out, they would create a branch inversion control for that new line of devices. So they had a number of different branches. Every time they add a feature or make a bug fix, they have to port that bug fix or feature across all these different branches. So they were spending 10% of their time doing code integration, 20% of their time doing detail planning, 25% of their time porting code between branches, 25% of their time on product support. What does that tell you, that large number on product support? What does that tell you? Quality problem, right? 15% of their time on manual testing. You subtract this from 100%, and what you're left with is 5% which they claim was time spent innovating, rather than what I would have been doing, which would have been lying down on the floor with a large bottle of vodka. <laughs> but they claim they were innovating. So this is pretty bad. And what did they decide to do? Well, they decided to do what is actually the riskiest thing you could possibly do. And who went to Camille Fournier's talk uh, before mine? Yeah, so they did a big rewrite, which is a nuts thing to do that I don't recommend. Uh, but they succeeded. <laughs> Uh, for reasons which we'll explore a bit later on. Um, and the key architectural decision they made was they architected the system for testability and they architected the system to be able to do continuous integration. So they subordinated their architectural concerns to building quality into the product. And what that meant was making sure that the software was, everything was built off trunk and they had automated tests in place for everything. So. That meant a complete rewrite because they had to change the way that they would manage the diversity of the product portfolio that the firmware was deployed to. So basically what happens is they put feature toggles in place. So device boots, firmware boots, wakes up, what am I? Oh, I'm a printer. So I'm going to switch off these scanning features and switch off these network features and just have my printing features. Or hardware boots, firmware boots. What am I? Oh, I'm a scanner, so I'm going to turn off these things. So basically, they managed the kind of heterogeneity of the hardware using feature toggles so they could build one binary for every device off of trunk, and everyone could work off trunk. And what that allowed them to do is practice continuous integration. They started practicing continuous integration and started building test automation, and pretty soon they found that the build was read all the time. And so the guy who was VP of engineering he kind of follows the HP management practice. HP management practice is called management by walking around. And it's basically going and walking around and asking people awkward questions, which is actually, it turns out, very close to the kind of Toyota production system. Go to Gemba, go and see what people are actually doing. That was his management style. And he would start saying, how can we stop people checking bugs into trunk? And people would be like, well, obviously, we would not do that if we knew and you know, brush him off and think that he was an idiot. And eventually, someone came up with what was actually a pretty smart idea. So after two years' worth of work, they evolved from their basic CI setup, a very powerful deployment pipeline, which I'm going to show you, emphasizing that this is after two years' worth of work. So this is not something they came to you straight away. Where basically, all of their developers had their own individual queue on Git. They would push their individual changes into their queue on Git. That would trigger a build and two hours worth of tests running against just that individual change. If that passes, all the changes got batched up and promoted to stage two. And that merges all the changes that got through stage one and runs build and about two hours worth of tests against just that batch. If that fails, if there's a merge conflict or a test failure, developers get an email. They configure the workstation so that developers can press a button and reproduce the test failure on their workstations by using virtualization and an emulator that emulates the uh, hardware platform. When you've got a build that goes through here, that gets promoted to level two, which is run two hours of tests that are run on an emulator. They built their own emulator for the custom ASICs, which are the kind of very complex logic devices that power printers and, and multifunction devices. So writing their own emulator was a pretty sophisticated bit of work. And then if the build passes level two, then it goes to level three, which is run on a bunch of logic boards that are actually in a rack. So the logic boards power up, download the latest version of the firmware that's passed level two, and then they run automated tests by like sending signals to the logic boards. So this is pretty sophisticated stuff. I actually carry around a copy of this book. I don't have it today, but I normally carry it around to clients so that anyone who complains that test automation is too hard, I can spank them with this book. Because if you can build test automation for firmware on logic boards, nobody has a problem that hard. 
So, th you know, this is a solvable problem. It's just, are you going to put sufficient work into fixing it? So this is a pretty sophisticated thing, and it took them a long time to build. If you get through here, you go to level four, which is overnight, 24 hours worth of, you know, in fact, 30,000 hours worth of automated tests that are massively parallelized, and you get feedback within a day on the quality of your software. So this completely changes the economics of the software development process. And this is something it took them a long time to get to, and it required a lot of investment. But here are the results. After three years, they're spending much less time on continuous integrate on integration because they're doing it continuously. They're able to massively reduce the amount of time that they spend on planning. And uh, I haven't got time to discuss why that is, but it basically, by having a more predictable software development process, they built up trust with the product side of things, and so the product people required much less detail in terms of their planning. So they said, we're going to let you change your mind at any time, and in return, we're going to create much less detailed plans, and they built up trust, and that helped them reduce the amount of time they're spending on detailed planning. They're not porting code between branches anymore. They're working on one main branch. Product support goes down from 25% to 10%. What does that tell you? Improving quality, yeah. High quality, much less time spent on product support. Testing goes down, and they increased the amount of time they were spent innovating by a factor of eight. Now, the smart people in the audience will notice that these do not add up to 100%. And the reason for that is because they were spending 23% of their time on managing the automated tests, building them, triaging them, getting feedback on them. So there was a substantial investment involved in creating this massive increase in productivity, yes. Sorry, yeah, so CPE is just their process for triaging bugs. You're welcome. Uh, and so this changes the economics of the software development process. Uh, and the reason I love this case study is because they measured these numbers and then they wrote a book. And you can go and buy this. It's a fabulous book. And this is a slide you, I just, you know, you can, get, you can download the slides. Anytime someone asks you what the value proposition is of continuous delivery or the return on investment, you can just give them this slide. So I only have 15 minutes left. What I really want to focus on is how they got from A to B. They did not plan this very complex deployment pipeline that they built. That was not something they knew they were going to create or that was part of their plan. It evolved over time, as did their whole architecture, as did their whole approach to building the system. And what drove it um, I mean, this is kind of extraordinary. What drove it is they independently invented continuous delivery. They were doing this before the book came out. They also independently invented something called the improvement cutter. So um, <laughs> this guy, Mike Rother, is a really brilliant researcher. He's a researcher at the University of, uh, where's, what, what state is Ann Arbor in? Michigan. So he's at the University of Michigan. He's a professor. He wrote a book called Learning to See, which is about value stream mapping. Uh, he's researched Toyota for many years. He wrote recently, two years ago, this Shingo award-winning book, which is fabulous. Highly recommend it. Um, and part of his job was to help US manufacturers try and reproduce what Toyota was able to do in their factories. So he would go and see what Toyota was doing, and then, uh, you know, US manufacturers would employ him to try and teach them how to reproduce Toyota's results. And he would say, well, they're doing these things. Maybe you should try doing these things. I mean, it was more sophisticated than that, but there was an element of that. And then he would go back to the Toyota factories a couple of years later and see what they were doing and notice they weren't doing those things anymore. So that was kind of embarrassing because it told these companies to go and do these things and they weren't doing them anymore. And then he'd say, well, now they're doing these things. Maybe you should try that and then go back. And then two years later, they weren't doing those things anymore either. And so it turns out, you know, this is actually a very important element of complexity theory. This idea that we can take a practice from one complex system and transplant it into a different complex system and expect the same results to take place is false. The whole point of complex systems is that if you take the same series of things and transplant them, you will get different results. This is why methodologies do not work. Methodologies are basically post hoc rationalizations of something that happened to work in a particular complex system at a particular time. And if you take that and put it in another complex system, you won't achieve the same results. And so what you see, if you look in high performing organization and you look at the practices they're, they're doing to see if you can copy them and improve your performance, 
What you're seeing is not best practices. What you're seeing is countermeasures to the particular problems that that organization is encountering right now. And if you try and copy countermeasures to a different environment, they will not produce the same result. What you need to do is learn how to effectively put countermeasures in place and evolve those countermeasures. And that is basically what Toyota knows how to do better than anyone else. And this is formalized in what Mike Rother calls the improvement cutter. And the improvement cutter is how you learn how to be able to put those countermeasures in place. Uh, and this term cutter is kind of important. Has any, who's seen Enter the Dragon? Okay, so Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee movie. Bruce Lee movie, sorry, Bruce Lee is flying into the evil guy's island. It's got an island, of course. Still waiting for my island. Anyway, evil guy has an island, and all the evil guy's henchmen are all practicing their judo moves on the islands. I can't do judo, so this is going to look ridiculous. But they're basically, you know, doing the same move over and over again. Ha! Uh, and that's what a kata is. Kata is taking a basic move and practicing it over and over again. It's like doing your scales if you're learning music um, or any kind of basic repeated thing that is a unit of whatever the larger practice is that you're doing. And so the idea is you've got to learn the basics first, and then you put them together and improvise uh, and combine them and, you know, create things. And so... Rother's insight was that people who are doing the work are always practicing how to improve the quality of their work. That's a habit. So learning how to run experiments to try new things to improve and put countermeasures in place and see if they work is a habit that everyone at Toyota is doing every day. And the job of management is to create the environment in which people can practice this habit of trying out new things and improving. And he basically, in this book, and I'm trying to summarize this book in 10 minutes, which is pretty difficult, and I really recommend you go and read it. This is basically the cycle of how this works. First of all, we understand the direction. So we look at where we want to go in like a couple of years. So for HP LaserJet Firmware, their vision was they wanted a 10 times increase in productivity. So that was their vision. Measurable, it's a goal, it's going to be hard to achieve. We don't know how we're going to do it. That's the direction. Then we grasp the current condition. How are things right now? And grasping the current condition is here. This is the current condition, right? And then the next thing you look at is what's the next target condition? And this is a horizon of about two to six weeks out. So we look at where we want to be in two to six weeks. And then we do not plan how we're going to get there because we don't know how we're going to get there because we're doing innovation, process improvement, innovation. And any time we innovate, you can't plan exactly how you're going to do it because then it's not innovation. And this is really crucial. The people doing the work have to try and work out how they're going to achieve the target condition through a process of experimentation. PDCA is plan, do, check, act. It's the Deming cycle. It's basically the scientific method. Design an experiment, run the experiment, gather the results, work out whether that thing is something you should carry on doing or whether you should stop doing it. And this cycle is at the heart of the lean startup, and it's at the heart of uh, process improvement, and it's at the heart of product development. And then, based on this, you're gonna f there's a feedback loop to the next set of conditions that you're going to try and establish the next month, and also to your overall vision. So that feedback loop is really important. You're not necessarily going to achieve all those target conditions, and so... Uh, and, and in the course of trying to achieve them, you're going to discover a bunch of stuff that's going to make you reset what your next target conditions are. So this all kind of sounds a bit abstract, so I'm going to give you an example of a set of target conditions that the HP LaserJet firmware people put into place. So they called these things, um, they called their iterations mini milestones, and they had them every month. And this is a table of their mini milestone objectives for mini milestone 30. So this is like two and a half years in. So rank zero, they wanted priority one issues open less than a week, and level two test failures fixed within 24 hours. And level one, they had a quarterly bit release. They wanted the priority one changes, uh, change requests fixed. They wanted the reliability error rate at whatever the release criteria was. And you can see they've got a whole bunch of measurable target outcomes they want to achieve by a month from now. And this was pretty much the entire planning for the whole of the next month for the whole program of 400 people. Fits on a single page. These are the measurable outcomes we want to achieve in the next month for the whole program. And we don't know how we're going to do this. 
The way we're going to find out is by people trying a bunch of stuff to work out how we're going to get there. And then based on the results, we're going to, you know, for mini milestone 31, there's going to be a new set. And it might include some of the same things or it might include some different things. And we're always changing what we measure and what we care about based on the outcomes of what people tried last time. So for example, you know, people always want to know what things to measure. And there's lots of things you could measure. I'll give you a, a great example. We once uh, did a project where we wanted 80% uh, test coverage from the people writing the unit tests. And we got 80% test coverage, which was great, uh, almost scarily quickly. And then we looked at the tests, and we found that all the tests contained at the end assert true. So they were calling all the methods in the code base, and they were asserting true, which created 100% test coverage and some totally useless tests. And this is, you know, a very common thing. You put a, a target in place, people will always find a way to achieve the target. But it may not be the way that you expect. And so actually working out whether the target produces the right behavior and modifying the targets and the things you measure as part of that process is very, very, very important. The crucial thing is, the people who actually work out what to do are the people doing the work. The people who actually get to come up with the ideas for how to achieve those outcomes are the people doing the work. They're their ideas. The ideas are not set by management. You're going to try these things, go off and do it. The people who are doing the work come up with their own ideas. And that's so important because it means that you're, you know, it's much more exciting to push through an idea that you came up with than it is to push through an idea that someone in management came up with. It's just not as exciting to implement someone else's idea. And by trying your own ideas and finding out what works and what doesn't, you learn how to get better at what you do. And that is crucial to any cultural change within an organization, is the people doing the work have got to work out how to get better at what they do themselves. And the process has to encourage people to work out how to get better themselves. And that's how you create a learning organization. Every day in this model, people are asking, what are we trying to achieve? right now? What's the actual condition we're facing? What's preventing us from reaching it? Which one of those things are we going to address right now? What experiments are we going to run to try and fix that problem? And where can we go and see what we learn from that? That's how they ended up with this very powerful deployment pipeline, by basically a bunch of things that they tried out to see if they worked, and gradually it assumed this shape. So they didn't implement deploy continuous delivery by reading the book. They implemented continuous delivery by trying out a bunch of stuff, and they kind of independently came up with it because it turned out to be a good idea. So kind of a couple of concluding thoughts. Uh, me and Gene Kim and uh, Puppet Labs recently ran a survey last year, the DevOps survey. So some of you might have filled in the DevOps survey that we put out end of last year. One of the questions we asked is, to what extent your organization is a high trust culture. And there's a really nice model for working out whether your cult culture is a high trust culture uh, by a guy called Westrom. So Westrom was a guy who was invent investigating uh, safety in healthcare. And he came up with this typology of organizational cultures uh, for looking at safety in healthcare. But it actually turns out the, this typology is kind of useful to think about any organization. And what we found out in the survey is that this is very highly correlated with business outcomes. So you can actually predict business outcomes to some extent by where people fall on this model. How do you get from A to B? How do you get, if you're pathological or bureaucratic, how do you get to generative? Well, it's very, very hard. I don't have a silver bullet, but an important part of that is giving the people doing the work the power to change their process and modify their process and try new things, and then not punishing them when those things go wrong. This whole idea that failure causes inquiry, not failure is covered up, and new ideas are welcomed, not new ideas are crushed. That's a really important part of creating a high trust culture, which is how you create a culture of continuous improvement, which is how you innovate. So in terms of leadership, really all these problems start and end with leadership. And there's a division of labor. The leaders decide the outcomes with a short horizon. And the short horizon is really important because you don't know whether the outcomes you want are actually the outcomes you want. 
And you'll typically find that your ideas about specifying outcomes produce the wrong behavior. So you've got to have a short time horizon so you can validate them. So the leaders decide what needs to be done, but the people doing the work decide how it's going to be done. That division of labor is essential. Leaders should not be deciding and managers should not be telling people how to do their work. The people doing the work should decide how they're going to do their work. And then the job of managers is to help the people who are working for them to run experiments and try a bunch of stuff and basically run the scientific method. And then crucially, we're going to update our outcomes, our vision, our metrics based on what we've learned in the process of trying a bunch of stuff. So finally, the job of automation is to help us to detect problems so that we as humans can go into problem solving, which is what we're good at. Use computers to do their things, the things they're good at, which is performing repetitive tasks. Use people for things that they're good at, which is solving problems. Always work in small batches, because when you're working in a complex system and you try something out, it's going to rapidly diverge from what you expect to happen, and so you want to limit the possible downside of things going wrong and get tight feedback loops. What you want to measure and improve ultimately is customer outcomes, and too few people are focused on measuring the customer outcomes. Continuous delivery goes from idea to measurable customer outcome, and if you're not measuring the customer outcome of the improvements you're trying, then you've got no way of knowing if they're actually improving the quality of the product that you're building. And then finally, if you want to learn how to implement DevOps or implement continuous delivery or pretty much implement anything, the answer is you do it through continuous improvement. And to quote my ex-colleague and friend Mike Roberts, continuous is a lot more often than you think. <laughs> finally, I just want to quote Jesse Robbins. Jesse Robbins is the co-founder of Ops Code. He was master of disaster at Amazon. He's a firefighter in his spare time and basically just a massive overachiever. Um, Jesse Robbins has a rule. Jesse says, don't fight stupid, make more awesome. And so if you're wondering what you can do to make your organization just a little bit better, the way you do that is everyone comes into work every day and thinks, how can I make life a little bit more awesome for everybody else around me? And if all of us did that every day, that's how you build a great culture and a great company. <laughs>